Welcome to Bruce Hurwitz Presents Meet the Experts. I'm your host, Bruce Hurwitz of Hurwitz Strategic Staffing. You can find us on the web at hsstaffing.com. I hope you'll consider us for all your staffing, career counseling, and professional writing needs. Momentarily, I will be joined by Lisa Skinner. We'll be discussing Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Meet the Experts is sponsored by P&K CPAs. P&K is a full-service accounting firm. They provide accounting and consulting services to businesses, ranging from startups to small and mid-cap companies to nonprofits, as well as high net worth individuals. Contact them today for a free consultation at info at pk-cpas.com or call them at 973-882-8810. They will be happy to be of service. Lisa, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me, Bruce. It is such a pleasure and an honor to be here. And as you know, this is this is a, a difficult topic for um, people to talk about. And I'm glad that you are supporting a raise, raising awareness of this difficult topic. So thanks so much for having me. It is my pleasure. Take a moment or two and introduce yourself to our viewers. Okay, so I'm Lisa Skinner. <clears throat> And I have been counseling and helping families and caregivers over the past 30 years, helping them have a better understanding of what is happening to the people they care for and the people they love, their family members, who are living with Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. <clears throat> Excuse me. And when I say related dementia, most people are familiar with Alzheimer's disease. It actually is the number one brain disease that causes dementia, but believe it or not, and it's uh, shocking, there actually are over 200 known brain diseases that cause dementia, but Alzheimer's is the most common. So that includes Lewy body disease and frontotemporal lobe disease, and there's actually over 200 of them. So we use the term dementia to refer to all of the signs and behaviors and symptomologies that are caused by one of these brain diseases. So I've been doing this professionally for 30 years, but my experience with Alzheimer's disease <clears throat> actually dates back almost 50 years. <clears throat> when I went to visit my grandmother one day, and I sat down in her living room just for a regular visit and chat. And she started to tell me about the birds that were living in her mattress, coming out at night and pecking at her face. Proceeded to tell me about the rats that were invading her home. And she pointed to the walls and said, see, don't you see them running along the walls? And then she told me about the men who were constantly breaking into her house. They wanted to harm her and they were stealing her personal items and her jewelry. Unbeknownst to me, what I was experiencing uh, was my grandmother displaying very common behaviors with Alzheimer's disease and dementia of hallucinations, delusions, and paranoia, which now, of course, I realize are all very common behaviors that accompany this disease. So my experience dates back longer than I'd like to admit. <laughs> and since my grandmother, I've had seven other family members develop one of the brain diseases that causes dementia. Uh, so eight total plus a dog. And five of those were blood relatives. So it obviously runs in my family. Mm -hmm. And um, the other three were through marriage. So my mother-in-law was was one of those. So, you know, it's it just has has brought me to this juncture in my life, personally and professionally. And I have decided to dedicate my life to helping other people understand the disease and teach them how to um, use best best practices. I've written, a couple books, one uh, bestseller, 
I have a training program, and I also have my own podcast, weekly podcast, where I talk about Alzheimer's disease on a weekly basis, so I can share my insights and expertise and information with any of you who might be going through this in your own life. I just want to clarify something. Do you have any academic background in in um, dementia, Alzheimer's? Well, yes, I'm a certified dementia practitioner. Okay. I'm a certified dementia care trainer. Okay. I hold a degree in human behavior okay. plus uh, 30 years of professional experience. So I have- I um, wanted to, to clarify that. Oh, thank you. So I have set up uh, memory care wings in, I was a regional director for the one of the largest um, assisted living and memory care. Mm -hmm companies out there. Uh, yeah, I and I've done a lot of training. So I come with a lot of, of knowledge and experience. I want people to know that. Uh, oh, I appreciate that very much. Um, from your bio. Now, I have a background with uh, Alzheimer's as well, because I worked for a good four years in two different nursing homes. Each one had an Alzheimer's ward, floor, whatever you want to call it. And the, the first time that I went up, I was the fundraiser. So the first time I went up, I was walking around and this woman looked at me and asked me who I was. And I told her and she said, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I just wanted to look to look around. And then she cursed me out. Who do you think you are coming into my home? And she's yelling at me. Oh, and goodness. I just let her go. That was the training that we received. You don't uh, engage. Let them say whatever they want to say. And a nurse came over to me and put her arm around me and said, I want you to go outside. Don't go into the elevator. Go into the stairwell. Wait 10 seconds and then come back in. I waited 10 seconds. I came back in. The woman looked at me and said, who are you? And now I knew what to say. I said, oh, my name is Bruce. I'm new here. And with your permission, I would like to uh, walk around. And she said, fine, please go right ahead. So I'm glad I you're telling this story because you bring up such an important point. It's all about what you say, your body language, how you say it, and how you present the information. And you experience that firsthand. And... The other thing is, the good thing, bad thing about Alzheimer's is they're going to forget everything in a few seconds. So they're not going right. to... Now, sometimes shock can also make them forget immediately. I will give you a... We screwed up badly. There was a shortage of nurses and nursing aides or okay. nurse aides. And the rule was everyone had to go through a week's training. Even though I was just a fundraiser, I had to take the training as well. Oh. And they needed uh, somebody to volunteer to work a night shift. And this new hire volunteered. And they said, okay. So she goes over... Uh, to uh, one of the residents in a wheelchair and says to um, Mr. Cohn, you have to um, uh, go into the dining room now to eat. And he said, no, I can't. I'm waiting for my wife. So she went over to the head nurse on the floor and said, he's waiting for his wife. No, he doesn't remember. His wife died a few years ago. So she started to walk back to the gentleman and I saw what was happening. The nurse who was, the, the head nurse saw and another nurse who was standing nearby saw and everything went into slow motion because we knew exactly what she was gonna do and we knew exactly what was gonna happen. And she said to him, Mr. Cohn, I'm sorry to tell you this, but your wife passed away a couple years ago. And he immediately burst into tears. Yeah. And the That's surprising. teachers, the teachers, the nursing aide burst into tears. 
the nurse got her out of there. And the um, the head nurse came, spun the wheelchair chair around, stopped it with a bang. Well, not a bang, but, you know, just stopped it in mid-flight, if you will, and said, Mr. Cohen, it's time for dinner. I'm waiting for my wife. Well, you'll sit facing the door. And when she comes in, or if she comes in, you'll... Um, She'll join you for dinner, and if she's upset, I'll take the blame. And he was fine with that. He didn't remember anything that had happened. And then we went in, we apologized to the young woman, told her she did nothing wrong. It was all our fault because she didn't get the training. And I looked at the nurse, and I said, I even know she shouldn't have been up here. And she goes, yep, we screwed up. And that was it. But the beauty of it was that they for is not... The sadness and the beauty is that they forget. So you can make a mistake and it won't be lasting. But the worst thing that can happen to somebody with Alzheimer's is when they're transitioning from early stage to moderate. And then that's when you have to take the car keys away. And there's idiocy, at least in this part of the world, that the police don't demand the keys. Yes. So technically speaking, somebody with Alzheimer's can drive a car, which yes. would not be good. No. So my question for you is, now, one other thing I wanted to point out. As a fundraiser, I was trying to raise money to help our Alzheimer's residents. Failed miserably. But then I changed the pitch and I focused on the caregivers. And then I could, then I raised a lot of money. Awesome. So it was a different focus. People didn't want to hear about the problems of someone with Alzheimer's, but they were willing to listen to the problems of a caregiver. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, very interesting. So my first question for you, is how do you broach the topic with someone with early stage dementia that they are going to need help when they are exceedingly frustrated, anything agitates them? How do you get them to accept the inevitable? That's a great question. It comes up regularly. It is a double-edged sword, and I'll tell you why. I have, one of the things that I have learned in the 30 years that I've been um, helping families cope with this situation is people are very reluctant to talk about it. Now, when they know that I do this professionally, everybody seems to have an Alzheimer's story. You do. And so um, they feel more comfortable talking about their personal situation with somebody who they feel understands and relates and empathizes with them. But I have found that for most people, it's like the proverbial elephant in the room. It's bigger than life. It's not going away. And because of stigmas and myths and... Um, misinformation, people are sometimes embarrassed, sometimes they're ashamed, and sometimes they're afraid of the stigmas that come along with people knowing that they have this situation going on in their family. So um, through my experience, a lot of people come to me and I have found since I've been doing my podcast, that it's a safe place for people to gather information about it because they don't have to disclose to anybody that they have the situation going on in their family and they can listen to what I'm um, telling them in a very safe place. And Bruce, to be honest with you, because I have been, this is my, I think my 30th year, I've only seen the paradigm and the attitude shift in, um, the general public in the last couple of years since COVID. 
And that's because uh, the topic is trending pretty regularly in the media. And it's getting a lot more attention and a lot more celebrity families are coming forward, letting us know that they're going through this, like Bruce Willis and Chris Christopherson and all the other celebrities uh, who, you know, we found out that that um, Barbara Walters had it for years and it was the best kept secret around until she finally passed away. I was aware she had it, but it wasn't common knowledge. So I definitely am seeing a, a little bit of a shift. And I just want to say, because this is addresses that question, you are not alone in this. And don't be afraid to seek out resources. It's going to take a village to get through this. It's probably if not the most difficult thing you'll ever be challenged by as a caregiver or a family member or a neighbor, it impacts everybody. There's no shame in this. We know the numbers are growing exponentially. Uh, it is projected by the year 2050. The number of people developing Alzheimer's disease is going to triple because of the baby boomers um, aging out. And because early onset Alzheimer's disease is becoming more common than we've ever seen it before. And that means that people start to develop the symptoms earlier than the age of 65, which is traditionally when the, um, the more common form of Alzheimer's starts to show up in people. So hopefully that answers your question. We had, um, yes, thank you. We had a an adult day healthcare program. Oh, good! And it was everybody there was, had Alzheimer's or some other form of dementia. And I was invited to because there was an event that was going to not an event. There was a visit. Two visitors were coming. A volunteer for another nonprofit that was called Pups in Prison. And these were puppies that were being raised by prisoners for, I forget, six months or a year, but they were taken out of the jails or penitentiaries a couple times a week so that they would learn how to interact with people in the real world. So they had a pet therapy program. No, this was no. a time deal. Okay. And, um, there was pet therapy of a kind, but not there. So it was a uh, golden retriever. And the minute I saw that dog, I said, this picture is going to go in every newspaper I submit it to. So we took a picture of the um, of an Alzheimer's uh, client, a very attractive uh, nurse, and the dog, and the volunteer. So I knew it was going in all the papers and every paper I submitted it to, it was accepted. Pretty girl, cute dog, it's a no brainer. But apropos of what you said and why I was telling the story when we were done, I walked over to the director and I said, you know, pardon me for saying so, but it's not right that one of the um, uh, staff should be utilizing supplies. I mean, helping a resident do their art, that's one thing. And she said, what are you talking about? And I said, the woman right there. She goes, Bruce, she's not a uh, on the staff. She's a patient. I said, how old is she? She goes, 35, 36. And this was a good 15 years ago. Shocked me. So yeah, it, it it's not a disease solely of the aged. No, and that's one of the myths that uh, you know circulates around there. And like I said, it's it's really becoming more common. What twenty years ago, twenty five years ago, um, it was rare. I worked at a uh, facility where the youngest resident was twenty eight years old. Um, that was really rare, but unfortunately and sadly, 
we are seeing the onset of younger Alzheimer's disease becoming more and more common. And, you know, scientifically, they don't know what's causing it for sure. But um, with all the studies that have been performed and our evidence base that are showing correlations between um, you know, medical conditions, existing medical conditions, lifestyle choices, diet, lack of exercise, lack of exercising and stimulating your brain. Um, plus that is a genetic form of Alzheimer's disease. If you carry the gene, it certainly does not necessarily mean you'll you'll develop it but the point i'm trying to make here is we're seeing more and more early onset uh, alzheimer's um than we ever have before so uh, just you know food for thought be aware and um it, it is striking younger people like bruce says now back to the nursing home Okay. I'm talking to a nurse. This happened twice, actually. And the daughter who's visiting her mother, grandmother, not important, uh, came running out and said, Mom knows who I am. She's all well. By the time she and the nurse, I didn't go in. It wouldn't have been appropriate. Again, I was just a fundraiser. By the time the nurse got in there, the mother didn't know who her daughter was. So I think that's probably the worst thing where you get your hopes up and then they're immediately dashed. Because Do you want me there's to... no recovery from no, all No, there's this. no recovery. And would you like me to explain to your audience why that happens so commonly? Sure. Okay. So... As we all know, and every one of these brain diseases does attack a different part of the brain, people do live with what we call mixed dementia. So they can have one or more brain disease going on simultaneously in their brains. And that's more common than people realize. But the hallmark of Alzheimer's disease which is the most common brain disease that causes dementia, first attacks the short-term memory. Now, in the beginning stages of the disease, the person's short-term memory is functioning pretty normally in the beginning stages of the disease. But as a person progresses through the disease to the mid-stage, starting about in the mid-stage, Think of that short-term memory as having a switch attached to it that can be turned on and turned off. So by the mid-stage of the disease, that switch is going on and off and on and off about half the time. What happens when that switch flips off and it is completely indeterminable when that's going to happen, it can happen on the turn of a dime, people then pull from their long-term memories because the long-term memories pretty much stay intact for the entire um, progression of the disease. So with that analogy, think of it this way, and I'll use your example. When that woman stepped into the facility and her mom recognized her, guess what? Her short-term memory switch was functioning perfectly and she knew exactly who she was she stepped out of the building and went back in and by that time that short-term memory switch flipped off so she, at that very moment that woman was pulling from her past life her long-term memories and it's quite possible that wherever she was in her life's timeline her daughter didn't even exist yet let alone be older, she could have been uh, back in the prime of her life when her daughter was young and she wasn't expecting to see somebody that was all grown up um, claim to be her daughter. 
And this is probably one of the most hurtful things that happens to people because they don't understand that this is actually happening to the brain of the person that they long to be recognized by. Um, during this phase of the disease, the short-term memory switch is temporary and typically comes back on. Sometimes it takes a little longer than your example. But unfortunately, just to prepare everybody, by the time um, we get to the end stage of Alzheimer's disease, that short-term memory switch is pretty much off permanently. Not 100% in a lot of people or in some people, but in a lot of people, they have no short-term memory. It's malfunctioned, it's short-circuited, and they are... Uh, stuck back in a previous period of their life. And the way you're going to be able to tell if that short-term memory switch is on or off is listen to the cues of what they're telling you. So if that woman, you know, goes in to visit her mom and, and her mom doesn't relate that face to being her daughter and she starts asking or saying something like, well, I'm going to have to leave pretty quickly because I have to go pick my daughter up from school. Well, that's a cue that she her short-term memory switch is flipped off at that very moment. And she thinks she's somewhere back um, as a younger mother and her daughter's at school waiting for her. So listen to their cues. That is the telltale sign if that short-term memory switch is functioning or not functioning. Are they in the same time frame and reality as you are? Or did that short-term memory switch just flip off and they're back somewhere in a different timeline of their lives? And this is a very, probably one of the most important things to understand about this disease. Um, they're not doing this on purpose. This is the disease you're experiencing. It's very common and happens very frequently. And if you just listen for those cues, so then if she all of a sudden starts relating you to her current reality, you'll know that switch went back on and she knows who you are and she knows that, you know, you are her daughter. So that's really um, an important takeaway for, uh, for knowing about what to expect. So the mother says to the daughter, I have to uh, leave now to go and pick up my daughter. Yes. That's got to be a knife in the heart of the daughter. How does she respond? So what we want to do, and this is critically important too, and these are some of the things that I work with family members and caregivers, and it's a um, ideology and a strategy that we call join their reality uh, because there's been other methods tried in the past and they we know they don't work. This is the best practice. And the reason why is because in their minds, they truly believe that wherever they are in their timeline of life, that's where they are. And there is absolutely nothing any of us can say or do to convince them otherwise so the best practice is to go along with what they're saying. And so what I would recommend is you say something like, oh, no, um, I know that, that the daughter, whatever her name is, Annie, is in school. But you know what? It's a little too early to go pick her up. So I'm going to visit with you until it's time and then try to get their attention directed onto something else. Because if you don't do that, she's going to um, grab onto that thought until she's satisfied that she doesn't need to be at the school picking her daughter up. And like you say, Bruce, they forget very easily. Mm -hmm. So if you distract them and get them interested in something else, hopefully she'll be happy with the something else and get off of that topic. She might bring it up in 20 minutes or 10 minutes and just keep um, validating her. Yeah, I know that you're a little anxious and that you're worried about getting to the school on time, but don't worry, I'm gonna keep track of the time for you and I'll let you know when it's time to go get her. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. 
And even though we're going to go a little bit over the half hour, I want to ask a couple more questions. Okay. Somebody loses their keys. They can't find their keys. And their immediately, immediate reaction is, I'm, I'm getting Alzheimer's. I'm forgetting things. Now, people, when they get older, they forget things. It's just part of aging. How do you reassure someone that they're not getting Alzheimer's, that it's not a big deal and don't make a big deal out of it? I'm glad you brought this up because not very many days go by where people don't come to me and, and with that exact story, with that exact concern. And it is a concern. So let me reassure everybody that there is, and this is a very common occurrence in folks as they age, we call it the normal aging forgetfulness process. It happens to all of us. It happens to me. I can tell you a couple of weeks ago, I walked into my kitchen. And then and remember what you life of me remember why I went in there. So I walked out and then I go, oh yeah, that's what I went in there for. Yeah. We all, we, I mean, our heads and our worlds are so full of noise and information these days that why wouldn't we misplace our keys? We're, we have so much information being thrown at us. So that is part of the normal aging process. Then we have what's called mild cognitive impairment, which is a step a little bit past the normal aging forgetfulness process, which that can occur there too, and very commonly. When we want to be concerned that maybe it's something going on more serious than the normal aging process or mild cognitive impairment, because mild cognitive impairment can progress into Alzheimer's disease and dementia, but it doesn't always. So you can just have mild cognitive impairment, mild memory loss, confusion, and never have it progress into actual Alzheimer's disease. So um, here's some, some telltale signs of it is progressing into something more serious. And I say this because most people today are not diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease until they're well into their mid stage of the disease because of the subtleties, the subtle signs and symptoms that show up that are actually part of mild cognitive impairment and or normal aging process. So these are some of the things that you might wanna look for that are signs of something more serious happening and you want to take your loved one to the doctor. They start repeating things consistently in the same conversation. They're asking you the same question over and over and over again in the same conversation because as Bruce said early on, they don't remember they just asked you. Um, they start telling you the same exact story over and over and over again in the conversation. They forget how to operate simple appliances that they've been using for decades, like pushing a button on a coffee maker to make their, to brew their coffee in the morning. People forget how to do that. Just simple tasks. So these are more telltale signs that there is something more serious happening. They forget how to, what we call task sequence. Something as routine as brushing your teeth in the morning, you forget if you have Alzheimer's disease, the order of putting, running your toothpaste, put toothbrush under the water, then you put the toothpaste on, then blah, 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 and you just follow each step that we learned when we were children, and all of a sudden you can't remember the order of each step. So these are all things that are significant. And it could be something else. There is no definitive diagnosis for Alzheimer's disease yet, but um, doctors do have ways to kind of um, eliminate what it's not and then determine that this is probably Alzheimer's disease. It's not foolproof. Chris Christofferson is a perfect example he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease and treated for it for three years. And it turns out he had Lyme disease because Lyme disease, once it hits the brainstem, um, mimics 
this a lot of the signs and symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. So the only way we can definitively diagnose Alzheimer's disease today, and things change minute by minute, is through an autopsy of the brain after they pass away. Now, you said one thing that I cannot let pass. Oh. You said that you have relatives who had Alzheimer's and a dog. Oh, yes, I did. So talk it's about a, the dog. Think this is my calling. <laughs> Eight relatives and a dog. Yeah, well, and I only care my... about the dog. I'm a horrible oh. person. No, 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 no. I, 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 I'm I'm... Just kidding. Relax. I actually have a chapter in my book about my dog, Oliver, who lived with um, doggy dementia for five years. So I want people to, How to know, do you know that a dog has dementia. OK, so I personally started seeing in my dog, Oliver, a lot of the same behaviors that I've been seeing in humans for decades. And I wasn't sure, am I just reading into this? Am I seeing things because... Um, you know, I've had eight family members. I, I can pretty well tell if somebody is starting to develop Alzheimer's disease. And at that time, I did not know dogs got dementia, even though I've been working in this industry for 30 years. But I was suspicious. It's like, why wouldn't dogs get it? They're aging just like we are. And there's a lot of treatments and, and cures and medications for medical conditions. So why not? So I took my dog to the vet. And sure enough, he did some tests. And he said, Lisa, you're not imagining anything. Oliver is suffering from what we call canine cognitive dysfunction. About 50% of dogs these days, because they are living longer, um, will develop it starting around the age of 11. My dog was 15 at the time. He lived to 18 and a half. And he said, you were, you were spot on. And I said, phew. And he said, well, there's no cure. Just like in humans, there's no cure. All we can do is give him the best quality life for the years that he has left. And I was able to do that because I was so experienced with human beings and, you know, the best practices and all of those things that I knew how to care for Oliver till the end. But what? were the symptoms? Oh, um, kind of that deer in the headlights look of confusion. Uh, he would get stuck in corners. He forgot how that he was potty trained. Um, he was restless. He was um, full of anxiety that I'd never seen before. If you know your pet, you will see the, ch the behavioral changes. Okay. Um, that we see in humans just as um, their brains are changing with this disease um, yeah. like we see in humans. So there are a lot of symptoms. Those are just a few of the ones that come to mind. But yeah, it, it becomes pretty obvious. Lisa, I want to thank you. But before I let you go, one final question. Is there anything that I did not ask you that you wish I had asked you? And if I had asked you, what would you have said? Um, I can't talk about the uh, what. Well, yeah. What um, so, for anybody listening to this discussion today, I have spent the last four months organizing a global Alzheimer's disease and dementia summit. It is free to attend. You are welcome to sign up. There's no um, obligation, there's no expectation. It is totally free to listen to the 27 speakers that I have um, rounded up to give you insights and expert information about living with Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. So go to summit at gmail.com and you can sign up for free. The date is January 23rd and 24th. And these are uh, an accumulation of some of the top experts in Alzheimer's disease and dementia from around the world. Um, the truth lies in Alzheimer's. That's my, that's my website and my blog. I also have on Facebook, a new support group that I've started. I have run support groups before. So if you're looking for a safe place to um, 
to discuss your personal situation, that would might be a good resource for you. Do I still have time to answer your other question? Lisa, thank you so much. We've uh, you've provided a wealth of information, and uh, I think this has been very valuable. I know it's been very valuable, and on behalf of all of our viewers, I thank you. Thank you again for having me and supporting raising awareness of, of Alzheimer's disease. Thanks, Bruce. Appreciate You're most it. You're welcome. I'm Bruce Hurwitz. Thank you for watching, and as always, stay focused on success. The time always goes by way too. Sorry. Hang on.